Are we doing a video call today? I'm glad to have a close one today. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Are you searching for a new job? That can be stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole, never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through the interview process just to find out at the very end that the salary, offer, or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Hired is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities in engineering development, design, product management, data science, sales, and marketing. We make your job search faster, focused, and stress-free. Instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best, Hired puts you in control of when and how you connect with compelling new opportunities. After completing one simple application, top employers apply to hire you. And on Hired, you receive personal interview requests and upfront salary information so you can make informed decisions about what opportunities to pursue over a condensed timeline. Hired offers access to more than 4,000 innovative employers, including big brand names like Facebook and smaller emerging startups. The size and type of company you want to connect with is totally up to you. And we help you find new opportunities in 17 major cities in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Open to relocation? Let them know. Your privacy and autonomy in your job search is of utmost importance. And if you sign up today using the show's link, that's Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues, you can get double the normal hiring bonus. That's $600 instead of $300. So go check them out at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Jerome Hardaway. Hey, everyone. Dave Kimura. Hey, everybody. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. A quick shout out about Ruby Dev Summit coming up. We have a special guest this week, and it's uh, Yanko Maronich. I hope I said that close to correctly. Yes. Hello, everyone. Do you want to give us a brief introduction, who you are, what you do? Uh, I am... uh... I'm a Ruby developer, a pure backend, and I am um, doing uh, work, and I'm also doing a lot of open source, and I'm really interested in generic libraries that don't have, like, that aren't related to Rails, but can be used in any, in any frameworks. Awesome. Now, I ran across some of the work you're doing with Shrine, which is a file upload, input-output kind of thing. Do you want to give us just kind of the two-minute version of what it is and what it does? Well, it is in many ways similar to other solutions. Uh, Some of the things that it does is that it tries to make, uh, it tries to solve the the existing problems better in a way that it uh, it gives you a lot of options uh, because there are so many different ways in which you can uh, do file uploads. For example, if you are uploading large files, then everything changes, and Shrine tries to accommodate for that use case as well. Uh, so basically, it tries to provide every option for whatever use case you might be having and whichever types of file you may be uploading. So. You know, in a way, it's it's uh, similar to to other solutions. It just tries to solve the same problems better. So, one of the alternatives that I've used over the last uh, number of years, and this this will show you how long it's been since I've done, <laughs> I guess, serious work in Ruby. But uh, I've I've been using Carrier Wave for a lot of the work that I've done. Um, what what does Shrine do then that Carrier Wave doesn't do? So. One thing is the, the way that I started exploring um, building a new solution was when I was working on my pet project and I wanted to implement like normal image uploads and I tried, I started with Carrier Wave and I realized that so one of my main one of the main things that I was missing in Carrier Wave and the other solutions was support for background jobs. Now there is a carrier wave extension for uh, uploading in the background, like from the from the backend side, or so for background processing. But it uh, it doesn't work reliably. So there is a case that when when you upload a file and the job starts processing and the records get deleted, there is a bug that it, you just start getting endless new jobs. 
he doesn't handle uh, many of the cases well, and um, and for example, he doesn't when you when you include it, he doesn't uh, delete uh, files in the background. So uh, it, yeah, one of the things that I was missing was to the uh, ability to have like stable uh, backgrounding uh, capability. And that makes sense because when the author of Carrier Wave was starting to build out Carrier Wave and other other people for other solutions, uh, they didn't have backgrounding in mind at first. So backgrounding feature was added later, and then the the, the library wasn't designed for that. So it makes sense that it it couldn't have been added stable uh, in a stable way. And so because uh, Shrine is kind of framework agnostic, so, you know, you, I guess you developed it so it can be used with just plain Ruby as well. Does it have good support for Rails? So, like, with the background processing, can it just get thrown into an active job and then you can use whatever background queue system that you want? Or does it kind of rely on its own mechanism? Yes, yes, you can You can hook up anything, uh, any any backgrounding library, so I've designed the interface in a way that the the uh, that what Shrine does is it serializes the data for you, or like it presents it in a JSON format, and then you need to call the background library directly, which means that it can be anything. It can be Active Job, but it can be also some custom backgrounding library. For example, at work we have like a custom solution that uses RabbitMQ, so you can hook up that. And then when you're inside the job, you just call Shine again to deserialize uh, or just to load to load all of the objects back up and finish finish the work, finish w w what he has started, whether it was uh, processing of images or whether it was deleting files. Cool. And does it, uh, you know, because I know when you get into uploading files and doing post-processing, or server-side processing, even in a background job, sometimes if it's not an image, let's say if it's a text document that you're uploading and you want to then do some kind of background processing on that document and then uh, you know pass the results back through Shrine for the data store, uh, you can get into some weird situations. So does Shrine work across uh, multiple different type of mind types or file types, or is it really geared towards images? Yeah, so it works for any types of files. And this is what I try to emphasize in the readme. I try to show different different uh, ways. For example, there is an example for video processing. The approach that Shine uses differently is that uh, processing is a Ruby method. So it, it calls the Ruby method, which you can implement in any way that you want. And it's like uh, it's it has a functional style. So you you get the original file at the input, and then you give it the processed files or process file or multiple files on the output. And that way, this processing thing can be anything. So there is a there are helper methods for image processing, but as long as you produce and an file object or an I/O object on the output, you can call whatever you want to call. You can even call an external service over HTTP to process files and uh, just return the result on the output. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like you know you've done a you've really thought of everything with Shrine. So, what's the biggest file that you've kind of load tested Shrine with? You know, have you run into any kind of memory leaks? Because, you know, when you start talking about larger amount of data, you know, let's say just like a one gigabyte video, you start to really see some of the edge cases and issues with uploaders as well as uh, on the back end, back end how Ruby handles things. Uh, the, yes, what you are probably talking about is if you would fire up a carrier wave, and then upload a two gigabyte file on a fifty on the five hundred megabyte Heroku instance, then uh, your Heroku instance will crash, likely because Carrier Wave uh, Carrier Wave uh, loads the whole file into memory. Yeah. And and this is like so. Sure, uh, I 
uh, was careful with Ryan that in at no point is the whole file loaded in memory, that everything is done via streaming. So, and for that, uh, it, it required patching some of the external libraries um, to support streaming or like to support large uploads because because with when you're streaming you you don't lose anything. It works for small files and for large files. So it it's not it, it makes sense to do that. It's just that I, I, I'm not sure like for example Kero Wave uses Fog and I'm not sure whether Fog supports streaming upload, but the AWS SDK official gem supports streaming uploads, for example. So then then you are you are able to Whatever, wherever you're uploading or you're processing, uh, we try and you're able. Uh, everything happens with streaming, so there is. It, it won't happen that your your uh, memory usage will like blow up if you uh, upload one file that's larger than a gigabyte. Yeah, and you know, kind of the reason why I asked that is because of the uh, downfalls of a lot of uploaders with loading the entire file into memory. So for the listeners, I mean, it's a really great feature of Shrine. And I mean, if that wasn't reason enough to use it, you know, it really should be. Because if you have to deal with anything over, you know, one, two megabytes, then your Ruby processes are really going to start to inflate. And that would just be overall a bad thing, you know, you would end up crashing the whole server just for a simple file upload. Yeah, that's correct. One thing that I was hoping we could go into with with this is, can you just explain what exactly goes into building a file upload system for Ruby or, or you know, Rails or, you know, similar systems like that? I mean, what, what are the concerns? I think we all kind of take it for granted. I'm just going to plug this in post to, you know, multi-part post and off we go. But, you know, I, I, I hadn't really thought about, okay, what does it actually do for me on the back end? It gets the file in and writes it to the file system, I guess, but what else? So, like, the file upload, that, like, the, the way that user f- uh, uploads the file into the app, that is handled for you by the web framework, be it Rails or Rack. Um, so, so that part, like f- uploading the file via multi-purpose to the application, is already taken care of. Uh, what Shrine does is that it, or what file upload li- f- file upload libraries do, is they 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 transfer. So, so they they there is a lot of conditions. So, for example, there is like file uh, file validation. So, what happens is that once the file is uploaded. The, it's stored into a temporary file. And then you can choose to, to store that temporary file into some storage, which is hooked in, uh, whether it is uh, whether it is like file system or S3 or anything like that. Uh, and then most of the heavy work, like all of the heavy work that's into uploading to an external service is usually handled by some gem. For example, for uploading to S3, there is Amazon S3, there is already a gem for that. So just try and make a wrapper around it. But th- there, is a, there is a lot of work into deciding which part of the file attachment process needs to go in which order. For example, you cannot, for example, Carrier, uh, Carrier Wave starts processing files uh, before validation which is obviously a huge security issues because because then then you are validating you if you have a file size validation uh, someone can still upload a huge file and give it to image magic and then image magic would crash and then and then your validation comes so it's it's important to to get the order first so i don't know first uh, you need uh, file validation then you need then it needs to be pro- processed if there is anything, or that processing uh, can be delayed into a background job. And it's also important that you are you don't upload in in an active record transaction. Uh, so because because or in a database transaction, because then if if some uploading or processing happens to uh, happens to last for longer time then your database transaction will be open for the whole time. 
But there are a lot of these these tiny decisions, what to do when, which is like which happens besides just uploading the file somewhere. That's awesome. So is there a, do you have any uh, blog posts or anything about a migration plan? So if someone was on Carrier Wave or Refile, if they want to switch to Shrine, do you have a good way to switch from one to another? Or is it kind of like, you know, hey, users will need to re-upload their images? Because all the, if you're keeping the same data store, whether using Fog as your mechanism to upload to S3, all the data is there. So I guess, can you uh, have your own custom mappings to the folder structure hierarchy to your upload destination to still use those same uploaded images? Yes, yes. So there is a, uh, I wrote migration guides for Caraway, Paperclip, and Raphael. Like what, what, what kind of code do you need to have? In order to transition from one to from one of those to Shrine, and yes, no, none of them involve uh, re-uploading the files because, as you said, files are already there. You just need to uh, you just need to assign the IDs. For example, um, CarrierWave will store store only only the file name or only the last ID, but the whole path to the file might actually be long. Long time, so uh, or longer. So in Shrine, you would in Shrine you would um, you would create a new ID, which is like the whole path to that file, and then you you can uh, then, then you can upload the that then you can uh, update the records with the file identifiers uh, in a way that Shrine will be able to find them, and that way you can migrate without. Copying files, you just need to do record updates, basically. That's awesome, man. You know, thank you for putting out those kind of migration things because, you know, whenever there's a solution, whether it's a background processor or a file uploader, no one ever really considers, hey, here's how you move from one to another or back to a different one. So, you know, I think that that's often overlooked because, you know, as technology gets old, you know, some things go unmaintained. And people need a switch. So that's really awesome of you. So uh, with Rails 5.2, I don't even think it's in a release candidate or beta yet, comes active storage. What do you think active storage will do to the future of Shrine? Well, I, I think that probably the age age would be the best person or uh, and other Rails <laughs> contributors to ask. But I like uh, the... The reason why I created Shrine is because I I wanted that. So active storage is is uh, rail specific. So and because I don't use Rails, I cannot use it. So I, for people who are not using Rails, they would need to re-implement the file uploader anyway. But I I think that active storage has many great ideas. Uh, there are. Um, one of the ideas that I saw, which was which I found brilliant, was they have a file um, which allows you to migrate from one storage to another by uh, enabling dual write or dual upload. And the elegance in which they, that problem was solved, which in the Shrine case is a big guide which is uh, takes many steps. Uh, I really liked, and uh, I, I like when I see ideas from other people like that. But uh, it, at the moment, it's really hard to tell because m- many of the uh, key features are missing yet. Uh, it's the AJH said that it's only uh, like an initial release, and that they will form some of the other basic features that are needed later. So I think at that at this point it's still difficult to tell, but in many ways it's similar to both Shrine and Raphael. Awesome. Uh, well, I have a question in regards to one thing you just brought up was you know it's not really intended to be used with Rails, which is a very unique practice because in the West, uh, particularly in the United States, Ruby's growth is with Rails like it coincides, but with uh, like when you're on the eastern side of the planet in japan ruby's growth is kind of you know is blooming without rails it's blooming as a standalone language in regards to like even with sinatra remotion or just using ruby in itself so my question was um is basically how are you like 
how is the community adoption implementation? What is your process with that? Like, how is that, like, here in the States, what usually happens is, you know, somebody popular raves about it and then, you know, because that's a cool guy, everybody else starts using it. Or if, or if you look at Node.js or, or Yarn, uh, it becomes, oh, this is super easy, so let me implement that. So what is your, for your Ruby, um, for your uh, tool, how is it implemented on, for, I guess, programmers? How, what's the implementation and the community adoption strategies for that? I'm excited to tell you about a new sponsor of the show, Rollbar. One of the frustrating things about being a developer is dealing with errors. Ugh. Relying on users to report errors or digging through log files trying to debug issues, such a waste of time. With Rollbar's real-time error monitoring, you get the context, insights, and control you need to find and fix bugs super fast. Getting started is as easy as gem install Rollbar. You can start tracking errors and buggy releases in minutes. Rollbar works with all major languages, including Ruby, Rails, Rack, and Sinatra. You can integrate Rollbar into your existing workflow, send errors to Slack or HipChat, or automatically create issues in GitHub, Jira, or Pivotal Tracker. They also have a special offer for Ruby Rogues listeners. Go to rollbar.com slash rubyrogues, sign up, and get a bootstrap plan free. That's a $49 value. Loved by developers at awesome companies like Heroku, Twilio, Blue Apron, Kayak, Zendesk, Twitch, and more. Give Rollbar a try today. Go to rollbar.com slash rubyrogues. So... Like I have a Google group set up so that anyone who starts adopting Shrine can can ask questions. But I'm not sure I, I will I am um it the setup or the the setup doesn't look that much different. It's not some significant less work, but the adoption is more more of someone like the adoption is more that that uh, I try to write a lot of blog posts emphasizing some of the some of the things that I, I think that are better, but it's mo- mostly I, I think most of the adoption goes to, uh, when started from the Go Rail screencasts, where when the author started to to uh, produce videos related to Shine, and then it was really nice for people to see how it actually looks like, how it goes from the start to finish. And I'm really thankful uh, to the author of Go Rails for that. Uh, so it's it's kind of, I think, Go Rails or what was for, or formerly rail, Railscast or any kind of screencast are a great, great way to, um, to bring any library closer to the white population. So basically what I said, like where someone popular used it in something and other people ran towards it or started gravitating towards it in a nutshell. Yeah, that uh, I, I'm i not, I wasn't aware of anyone who was famous in the Ruby community who started using the Shrine, but uh, it definitely helps when, when someone, uh, when there is a wide adoption or when someone starts tweeting about it. Roger that. Thanks. One thing that I'm wondering related to this is you mentioned that, yeah, you're not you're not working in Rails, and so you didn't design it to work solely with Rails. I'm curious, what, what stack are you using? Like, is there a stack or a use case that you find is your, you know, kind of your, your preferred way of using Shrine? My, uh, my stack, my preferred web framework is Roda. Okay. Uh, which, which you... Um, there was uh, uh, you had Jeremy some time ago. I remember uh, speaking about Rhoda and Rhoda and SQL, which are both Jeremy Evans's gems. Mm-hmm. So R- Rhoda would be for Rails, and uh, SQL b- will be uh, Active Record counterpart. This is my stack that I was that I was using, and it's really not different than how you would uh, do it in Rails. So Shrine should be equally convenient to use. In Rails frameworks than in Rails framework than in other web frameworks, but making it generic for any web framework or RM, it uh, led to some design decisions that uh, where we try to thin out the integrations. So, for example, if if I would if Shrine is able to work without any RMs, then if I would make an Active Record integration or SQL integration 
it's good to make those integrations as thin as possible mm -hmm. so that most of most of the the logic is generic so that's what, when someone is uh, integrating with a, a, a third ORM or, or another framework that that there is less work to get started. So is there anything else out there that you feel like these upload file management gems are missing that you're looking at adding to Shrine? At the moment, uh, at the moment, uh, Shrine has like most of the features that I, I planned or like, or the, there isn't, there aren't, I didn't see many, uh, I didn't see any features that I was, I'm still yet to copy to Shrine. It would be really great. I think it's great when people start writing more integrations. For example, there is still Azure integration missing, which is, which would be really nice to have. But because I started right working on Shrine by looking at other file upload gems, then I, I already knew most of the features that I wanted to support up front. Mm -hmm. And that way, that way I was able to get most of these features already in, in, the, in the first release or the second release. And that, that really helped. Like reading other file upload libraries really helped in understanding the problems and in understanding, um, understanding what, what are some of the errors that might happen and that that why I am like pretty much aware. So one one thing, one feature that you will not find in Shrine is uh, on demand processing. On demand processing is uh, it means that when the one when the file is uploaded initially, uh, it is uploaded in a raw format, or it's the the processing is minimal. And then when people, when you are generating URLs for uh, different thumbnails, then uh, that URLs hit an application which processes these, file, these files dynamically. And then these process files get uh, uh, cached in some cache. And that way you are much more flexible because whichever URL you generate, you don't need to do any kind of reprocessing. You just... Uh, you, you just need to, um, you don't need to do any kind of reprocessing, you just need to uh, generate a different URL. So the information about processing is written in the URL. And this is a feature that Refile and Dragonfly have. But in Shine, I have decided not, not to add that because, because you can use those gems to achieve the same feature. So, mm -hmm. Many many people think that if you if they now need on the fly like on demand processing, then they now have to use a different file upload library. But the way the way that files are served is a totally separate responsibility to the way that files are uploaded. So you can use Shrine to attach files and upload them to storage, and then for example you can use Dragonfly or a file to to serve. Uh, to serve thumbnails which are dynamically processed. And that way, uh, these gems that have those features built uh, the on the fly processing feature built in, they can you can still use them for what they do best. and then you can uh, and you can use shrine for all of the other parts. Yeah, the whole on the fly processing thing always kind of rubbed me wrong because that's, Definitely not efficient for serving assets. You know, if you're not behind a CDN, you know, you'll definitely put undue taxing on your CPU. It's also the thing that uh, Ruby isn't that good at streaming, or isn't that fast as a language. So, uh, for processing, it's it's much better to use tools that are written in other languages. And also, the reason why. The reason why it's not good to use a file upload library only for on-the-fly on processing is because for uh, files like videos, it's not, it's not uh, the on-the-fly processing is not feasible because it takes a long time to transcode the video, and that way, that way you you will need to process in the background like on the on the background job because it's not the user 
it takes too long for the user to have to wait for the file to get processed, even if it was just an initial version. I don't know if I have any other questions. Do you, Dave? I can't think of any. Well, do you want to talk to some of the security points of Shrine? Because I know with Refile, when you upload the file, it does do a obfuscation of the URL, so someone can't really just kind of guess what the uh, URL is for a file. But there, I don't think that there is inherently or by default any kind of uh, security protecting those assets. So what can you talk to about the security of files uploaded with Shrine? I think what you, what you were talking probably was authenticating uploads. So for example, if I upload the file uh, to some URL and then another person who holds the URL to the file should, and which is not authenticated as me, uh, shouldn't be able to to, to view that file and to achieve to do that you you need to you need to do that from your rails app so for example you generate a, a URL that that goes into a rails controller or, or any other web framework and then do authentication like use device and then you can uh, fetch the file from the, the storage and stream it into the response, which is basically what, what Rails does already automatically for, for your static assets. It's basically, it's just, a, it's just a, an endpoint which uh, can stream files from the file system into, into the response body. So in, if you want to authenticate uploads or authorize uploads, you need to do the. You need to serve the files from your Rails app, because you need to intervene in between the request and the response. Just for the listeners, another way to do that is you know to have a URL that points you know back to your Rails application, but then if you have on S3 any kind of signing, then you can um, generate the URL or you know the signing token for S3 and then do a redirect and it should serve the asset as well. There's some caveats to it, but you don't have to serve it directly from the Rails application, like do a fetch and then send data back to the user. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, and other some other cloud services also provide uh, expiring URLs. I just saw in, I think in um, one of the t- tickets, on one of the file upload libraries that for some user expiring URLs weren't secu- wasn't secure enough, even that. And so, so there are still use cases, but major- for majority of use cases, if you are using, if you know that you're using S3, then uh, expiring URLs, I agree, that's a good way to go. So how much time have you spent on uh, Shrine? Uh, it's been about almost two years. Two years since you know, since the first commit. Over the time, the behavior started to branch out. There were ex- I've also released some kind of gems that are related to Shrine, but can be used standalone. And that's that's all. So one other thing that comes to mind is that you essentially wrote a gem that fills a need that there were several other gems already out there to fill. Do you have any words of encouragement or? advice for people who are seeing some need out there where it's, hey, look, there are probably six other gems that do file uploads or, you know, whatever their problem is, but it just doesn't quite do what I want. You know, it doesn't integrate with the the delayed job libraries or whatever. Should they create their own library or should they s- submit a pull request to something like, you know, I assume you could have submitted a pull request to something like Carrier Wave. And then, you know, if they didn't accept it, then, then I don't know. I, I guess I'm wondering, where's the trade-off, right? Because wouldn't it have been easier to submit a pull request instead of writing a new library? The problem when I was uh, using uh, Keter Wave in the beginning then and Paperclip before that, I was having a hard time to, to, write, to write pull requests because I felt like that the... The logic, the behavior was really complicated, uh-huh. and and when I did, when I started looking out for new solutions, 
I that's about the time when Raphael, Raphael first came out, and Raphael was written by the author of Carrier Wave uh, to kind of make a, a simpler gem for the as an alternative to over engineered Carrier Wave, and I liked the gem so much that I started contributing to it, and I wanted. I wanted that to be my uh, solution at the beginning, but what made me to create Shrine to stop contributing to Raphael and create Shrine was that Raphael was created to be opinionated. Mm -hmm. So that there is a, if you are not using it for a use case, like if you don't want on the fly processing or if you have some other needs, uh, it doesn't. It's not easy to extend or to to add features. And then I then I wanted to create a file upload library that is unopinionated or the non-opinionated. That is uh, that that basically because mo all of these features that Carowave, uh, Paperclip, and Raphael have, they are all there are many problems which are which can. Which can be solved already uh, in, in in the library. All right. Well, anything else that we should dive into with this, Dave? Anything you want to ask? No. No, I think it's a great contribution to the community. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks then. Do you ever have issues crop up in production that you don't see in development? Do you even know how your app is performing in production? Performance errors and analytics to figure out where your app is bogging down are important to keep an eye on. You could try one of those error tracking apps, but why not use a tool that does it all? Try Datadog. Datadog tracks performance, collects data on your errors, and provides you with the information you need to improve your user's experience and fix bugs without having to log into the production server and dig through the logs. What if my app spans across multiple servers and services, you ask? Datadog seamlessly collects metrics from every corner of your application, including services like Amazon AWS and systems like Redis. So whether you want a clear view into your application's performance, need to be notified of new errors, or to keep track of your application across various services you use, use Datadog. If you go to devchat.tv slash Datadog and start a free trial, they'll send you a free Datadog t-shirt. Dave, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, I have a, a non-tool related pick. This time, no. it's called oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Wallabag. So I'm really big on self-hosted solutions. You know, not really using solutions hosted by someone else. So uh, Wallabag is basically a reader. So I can just pop in a URL. And it'll scrape that website for that article, then bring it down onto my own server. So I can just have basically just a bunch of bookmarked blog entries that I can just read from my phone or something, but it's all self-hosted. So basically it makes a copy of that site. So if it ever goes down or stuff changes, then I still have the original copy that I liked or wanted right there on my own server. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm going to jump in here with a few picks. The first pick that I have, I got a new power tool. <laughs> <laughs> And just to give a little bit of context, so I, I may or may not have mentioned it on the show before, but my dad has, uh, he's disabled, he has some issues just getting around. And the stairs from his garage into his house, which is the way that he usually would go in, those stairs had about an eight inch rise on each step. And usually in most houses, it's, you know, six, six and a half inch rise. And so it was really tough for him to get up those stairs. So my father-in-law and I went over there and ripped the stairs that were there out and put in new stairs. And those have about a five and a half inch rise. And anyway, so a few things that we used to pull, put that together. I was sitting here thinking, I was thinking the other day, I was like, yeah, Dave's going to be jealous because I got these tools. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, I, it turned out I didn't have a skill saw. So I wound up picking up one of those for like 30 bucks at Home Depot. It worked really nicely there. I already had a chop saw or miter saw, so that was another tool that we needed. But the other one that I thought was really cool is he had stair points. And what you do is you you basically uh, use the screws in them to tighten them down onto a square. And then on a 2x10 or a 2x12 board, you just uh, line the the square up on there after you've, you know, basically set the points for, you know, the, the run and the, the depth of the stair. And then you just move down the stair and you draw your 
you draw your stairs onto that uh, that stringer for the stairs, which is the board that goes underneath that you can attach the the treads to and things like that. And then, yeah, you just cut it out with a skill saw. And I thought that was pretty slick. So, yeah, I can build stairs now all by myself. <laughs> but uh, That's awesome. Anyway, it, it was really cool. So, uh, yeah, so just the, the stair points and uh, the skill saw are my picks. Uh, Yanko, what are your picks? I recently discovered or started learning more about Event Machine, mm-hmm. which is, which is a, a Ruby library for which implements the reactor pattern like Node.js. And I started researching it because, uh, because I was, uh, it was related to file uploads uh, because it, it allows streaming both ways. And I just find, find that library fascinating and uh, the, the community around it really interesting. interesting. And I feel like that it has it has gone down over the time, uh, but I I think that for some needs where you need like great throughput for applications, you can uh, yeah you, you can use uh, Event Machine for that. And another pick would be for me it is uh, TASIO, which is. Uh, HTTP protocol for resumable uploads, and it is an HTTP API which both client and the server can Im- implement to achieve like reliable uploads even on the even on networks that are unstable. And I find it really great that there is like a generic protocol for for something like that. And I I read some story about some uh, fire firefighters. Uh, saying that they really loved to use that they really uh, it really helps them to use that functionality because it allows the it allowed them to to send uh, pictures from from fires from houses uh, in any kind of situation reliably over the network and then people who are working there like who are not on the scene who are working there they they can get a, a, a great overview of, of how the, the thing look like, how the, how the environment looks like. And it's really cool to, to see what kind of use cases there are for, like, for reliable things. Yeah, that, that, that's it for me. Cool. Cool. Well, if people want to uh, check up on what you're working on these days, uh, follow you on Twitter, GitHub, wh- where do they go? Uh, they can just go to the well, my GitHub handle is Yanko Desham, and I'm on Twitter at like my first and last surname. So you can basically see what I follow by or what I do by by the GitHub activity. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. This was fun. Yeah. Thanks. All right. We will Th- uh, catch everyone next week. All right. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.